in your Bible there to Revelation 19. If you found it, got to verse 11, I'm going to ask you to rise to your feet as always to pay tribute to the reading of God's Word. Revelation 19, beginning in verse 11. And, and this is what John wrote. He says this. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he does judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, right? The Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed and fine linen and white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. Why? Because his word is a two-edged sword, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the sword of his word. That with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the, the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourself together unto the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, and the flesh of captains, and the flesh of mighty men, and the flesh of horses, and of them that sat on them, and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beasts, and the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together, why that one world system, right, Babylon system, together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnants were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, whose, uh, which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The Battle of Armageddon. Good versus evil. This world coming to an end. Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you and God, uh, we want to preach today uh, the, the, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God, Revelations uh, in chapter 1 tells us that it's about the revealing, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we find in a world, dear Heavenly Father, that's been sin riddled, in a, in a world that has stood and denied God and, and Christ, a, a world, dear Heavenly Father, that's coming to an end where good uh, triumphs over evil. Where God, we know that we, the people of the church, we that have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, are victors in this time, in this day. God, I just pray that our focus would be, even though Revelation has carried us through many things, what Revelation has focused on is Jesus Christ. And God, today, that that would be our focus and seeing the description of Christ coming as he prepares for battle, what we call the Battle of Armageddon. When good does triumph over evil, God, I pray today that it would give us hope, that it would give us, dear Heavenly Father, that promise of being victors, not victims of the world. Just be with us, watch over, care for, and keep us, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by sharing, and this chapter, again, it gives us the picture of what chapter 1 was telling us about how Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. There's coming a time, I shared with you, that I know there's people that don't believe this world is coming to an end, but in Genesis 1-1, it tells us in the beginning, if there is a beginning, there must be an end. See, our God has no beginning because He's everlasting. And so this world that was spoken to existence by God, John 1-1 tells tells us that Jesus Christ was the Word and He was there and nothing was created. See, the Trinity of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit has always existed. But not this world. This world has a beginning. And because it has a beginning, there's going to be a day one day when it's going to come to an end. 
Sin has riddled this world uh, uh, for ages now, and Jesus Christ is the answer. And we see at the end the judgment of the just uh, uh, judge that Christ is. And so we begin here by John seeing uh, uh, the, the triumphant Christ coming, not the defeated one that hung on the cross as the world would say, but this time the world is going to see the triumphant Christ. And so we find then the virtue of the king. Let's look at the virtue. I remember the account of the Lord that John penned in that chapter 1. There on the, on, on the island of Patmos, uh, when he beheld, he said this, I beheld ki the king in all his glory. The Bible tells us in these verses that every eye is going to see. It is here that the glory of Jesus Christ is going to be uh, revealed. These verses reveal the glory and the splendor of the coming of the king. Now look at this as the Bible uh, breaks it down for us here. John does uh, in the writing inspired by the Holy Spirit. Look at his uh, Wonder. There are several things about his wonder that we need to see. Jesus appears uh, on a white horse. Uh, the world will see the one who is, here's what it says, uh, faithful and true. So his wonder, the, the wonderment about it, the wonderfulness about it, is that Christ comes back again. Not the defeated one as the world saw him hanging on the cross. You and I know he wasn't defeated. You and I know that he was going to defeat death and did so and defeated sin there. But for the world that looked at him on the cross uh, uh, who mocked him and laughed at him and, and the devil who thought he had won that battle and, and had Christ hanging on the cross uh, as he left he uh, as he left this world uh, many stood at the cross shaking their head at, at Jesus Christ they, they mocked him and said if, if he's God let him save himself and he saved others let him save himself if he can't he if he will do that we'll believe in him and and, and that didn't happen and so uh, they literally mocked him they stripped him down of his clothes and and, and all those things that happened there being beyond recognition we're about to celebrate the Easter uh, time and, and, and all of these things is true. And, and so we find, though, that that's not how he's coming back. We find there's a, a wonder that is there. And, and part of this wonder is, is that he is faithful and that he is true. Do you know uh, Satan is the author and the father of lies? But here's the thing. Let's see, ever since the fall of man, we've been, mankind has been living under the, the, the influence of the father of lies. But the king is coming, the Bible says, and this one is not like Satan. This one is faithful and he's true in all his ways. He is a, a God of His Word. I'm so thankful today that God's Word uh, is true. I'm so thankful today that I can stand upon the promises of God's Word. What God says and who He said. Remember, I, uh, again, it's not I believe in God, but I believe God. I believe God uh, as far as who He is and what He says and what He does and the promises that He made. And, and so He is faithful and true. Uh, he, he is a, a God of His Word. Every promise that God has ever made, He will keep and fulfill. Matter of fact, Romans chapter 3, write this down on your page, go back at home, look at it, read it, remember it. Romans 3 uh, uh, verse 4 says this, it says, Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. That's exactly our God. And, and I, I've said many times and asked you, have you ever told a lie? Everybody in this place would raise their hand. God has never lied. Why? Because it's not his nature. He doesn't have a sinful nature. And so everything that God says, every word of God is true. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 20 says this. It says, for all the promises of God in him are yet. And in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. All his promises are yes. He cannot go back on his promises. He cannot, uh, he cannot say one thing and then turn around and say something else. And so his wonder, not like he was, like the world saw him on the cross, but his wonder is that he's coming back just like he said. He's coming back faithful and true. He, he made the promise to, to the disciples. He's made the promise to the church. And that John chapter 14, one of my favorite. Uh, listen, 
Uh, let your heart, let, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I, I go and I prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, faithful and true. I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And so we find then uh, the wonder of him is being faithful and true. But not only that, notice what John writes. John said he is faithful and true in verse 19, but he goes on and he says this. He that sat upon, uh, uh, upon the horse, upon that horse, he, uh, him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. John says not only is he faithful and true, but here's the thing about our God. Here's the thing about Jesus Christ. He is full of righteousness. Now what does the word righteousness mean? It means rightness. There is no wrongness. And so he is full of rightness. And so Christ is coming back. And John said, uh, again, he's, the, the, this world has suffered under the, the heavy hand uh, of, the, of, the, of the power hungry in this world. Right? The, uh, listen, inconsiderate men and, and dictators of this world whose only objective was to gain more wealth or, or to gain more power, to gain more prestige, to gain more riches. Uh, the world has been under, under those like that. But here's one that comes uh, full of righteousness. Much of what we see and experience in our, our day is, is, is without justice. Dictators rule not by righteousness, uh, by the evil hand to suppress those that uh, they rule over. They have no compassion for those that they rule over. Jesus will come. This is what John would share with us in writing this. He is a uh, rightness. He has his rightness and rightness with God. Jesus is going to come to set the record straight. He's going to set the record straight. He will come as a, this is why I know the record is straight, because he comes as a judge. He's going to judge, and he's going to be a, a, a right judge, a righteous judge. He's going to judge it the right way. He's going to set the record straight. And so we find, uh, uh, we find him here. Uh, uh, listen, men will be judged by, by a holy, his holy standard. Not by your standard, not by my standard, but by God's standard. Listen, this will not be the battle of, of a power-hungry dictator. No, it will be a war of a holy God, uh, listen, uh, who has come to declare His holiness and to bring His judgment upon those who have denied Him and those who have earned their just reward. His judgments are righteous and true. John says, I see something else about him. He said, I noticed something about his eyes. His eyes were like flames. His eyes, look at verse 12. His eyes were as flame of fire. The all-piercing look. I've often uh, said that when Peter said he wouldn't deny Jesus Christ and he goes out and he denies him three times and later on Jesus turns and looks at him. When the rooster crows, uh, uh, Jesus turns and looks at Peter and Peter just breaks down. I can just imagine the look that Jesus Christ gave. I can just imagine the look, this fire, this all-seeing eyes of, of Jesus Christ. John describes his eyes as ones of flames of fire. The all-seeing eye of, of Christ. Nothing is going to get by. Nothing can get under the cover of darkness. You know mankind has tried to live under the cover of darkness, of, of sin. Under the cover of darkness, uh, of, of lies. And, and indulging in, in pleasures of the flesh. But, but listen, but Jesus, with those all-seeing eyes, those flaming eyes, has seen every detail of every person's life. Think about that. He has seen every act of wickedness. He has seen every time someone has turned against him. But not only that, notice what he says in that verse 12. He said, I saw his eyes, man, they were like flames. I, that piercing eyes, those piercing eyes of flame that was coming. And then notice the next thing there on verse 12. And it said, and on his head were many crowns. Notice that, many crowns. 
And he, and listen, there are those in this world that have wore crowns upon their heads. There are those that have been kings on this earth. But all of those crowns, listen, cannot stand against uh, the God. He, he literally, John says, I see all the crowns, uh, uh, all the crowns that men wore and all the crowns that they claim to be the king. All of that is on his head because he is the king of kings. And on his head uh, was many crowns. He's the King of King and the Lord of Lord. And so uh, it just shows uh, that he's coming, listen, not defeated, but he's coming in power and he's coming in authority. He was despised by men. He's been belittled. He's been rejected. Uh, he was rejected the first time that he came. But listen, the Lord uh, uh, was, was given a crown of thorns the first time that he came. He, he didn't have a place to be buried. He was in a borrowed tomb. But when he comes again, he won't be as before. He'll, he will come wearing a crown of glory, not as a, a humble man, but as a ruling judge being seated on the throne of power. For his kingdom shall be a kingdom that shall last forever. Amen. John said, I saw it. I saw it. An angel showed this to me. It showed me his wonder, his true and righteousness. He showed me his faithfulness and, and how he's true and true and righteous. A judge with flaming eyes and, 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 and crowns upon his head. But notice the next thing was his witness. Who is this one? What is the witness of this one that is coming? And so we pick up and it says, and he had a name, verse 12, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. I love this. You know what this is? This is like, listen, you and I don't know this name. Nobody knows this name save for the Father and the Son. I think this is the name that God calls Jesus Christ. This is that intimate name that they share with each other. It says there that nobody knows this name uh, he has a name that, uh, that, 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 that surpasses our way of thinking. Do you know Jesus has had a lot of names? You know, Jesus had a lot of names in the Bible. For an example, to the hungry, he is the bread of life. The Bible says that he was the bread of life. That's what the hungry could call him, uh, the bread of life. Uh, the thirsty, the Bible said that he is the living water. He told the woman, you drink of me, you'll never thirst again. Why? Because he can supply that spiritual uh, refreshing like water does to a thirsting soul. When the body is thirsty, when the spirit is thirsty, he is the drink of the, the, the living water that we can drink and, 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 and just replenish our, our spirit, our soul. He's the living water. The despaired, the Bible says in Isaiah that he is a counselor. When we don't know what to do, when we don't know where to go, we don't know where to turn, he is our counselor. The Bible says that the sheep that he knows, the sheep knows the voice of their shepherd. For the sheep, his name is the great shepherd. The Bible says that he is the cornerstone. For the builder, he is the cornerstone. For the wayward, they don't know how to find their way. He is the door to all that belongs to him. To all that belongs to him, he is Lord. To all that belongs to him, he is master. To all that belongs to him, he is king. But in this verse, John says that there is a, a name that no one knows. This is the name. This is a, an exclusive name. It's an exclusive name. Jesus has a, a name that no one knows but himself. Listen, I can't offer any suggestion to what that, that name might be. But I just know this. All I know, it is a name that is reserved for the Lord. I believe it is the name that the Father calls him when the Father calls him by name. It may have to do with the end of the grace period time. I don't know. For thousands of years, the wonderful name of Jesus has been preached. I'm sharing with you today that wonderful name of, of, of Jesus. But there's a name. There's a name that no one knows. You know, there's some out there that has used his name and they've cursed his name. There's some out there that has used the name of Jesus to defy God. These have refused to know the name, even as we preach it, of Jesus. 
And, and yet, here is a name the Bible says that no man can know. Why? Because of the wonder of who he is. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. He has an exclusive name. Nobody has that name. It's an exclusive name. Now here's the other thing about it. Is it is an eternal name. It's an eternal name. How do I know that? But he goes on in verse, thir uh, 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 verse 13 there. And he says, And he was clothed with a vesture dipped. And his, his name is called the Word of God. Here's a name that John 1.1, 1, 1, John writing this, told us in John 1.1, 1, 1, that, that, that the beginning in the beginning was the Word of God. He is the Word of God. He is the living Word of God. He is the eternal living God. His name is called the Word of God. Again, the eternal one in the beginning was the Word in the beginning of creation. He was already there. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. It is an eternal. His word is eternal. It is the eternal name. The word of God. It reveals, the word of God reveals the eternal nature of Christ. There has never been a time, listen, there has never been a time when he didn't exist. Amen. There's never been a time when he hasn't existed. There has never been, a, there would never be a time when he doesn't exist. It's an eternal God. The eternal God humbled himself to, to put on a robe of flesh. And, and he came down for the redemption of mankind. He, 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 he desires to illuminate the, the hearts of, of those who, who need a Savior. Listen, he, he came to fulfill the, the word in human form. Uh, he, he, the, fulfilling the promise of God. He is the word. He is the word. So he has an exclusive name. He has an eternal name that is the word of God. And then he has, and notice this, an exalted name. Look with me in verse 16. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name that is written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no other name that can compare to the name of Jesus Christ. He has the name King of Kings. That means out of all the kings, he is the king above all kings. Out of all lords, uh, he is the Lord of all. Never has a name moved so many or mean so much to humanity. The name Jesus. Amen. Think back in the ages and throughout the time. Massive have, of humanity has been moved by this name, Jesus. Never has a name brought such hope and joy in your despair. We can cry out to the name Jesus. The Bible says that there is no name in heaven and earth like that name. It is the name that gives us an eternal hope. The name Jesus. Never has a name changed the eternal destiny of mankind like the name Jesus. Jesus' name has the power. See, anything you ask in my name, right, will happen. Why? Because in that name, demons stand and shake. And there is no name in heaven and earth whereby we can call upon like the name of Jesus. Why? Because he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the sovereign God. He's the creator. He's the ruler of the universe. He is the one to whom all others will bow. For every tongue shall confess and every knee will bow one day. He has been given a name above every name. I rejoice today and I have submitted my life to the rule of the Savior. I haven't just heard that wonderful name. I put my faith and trust in that name, Jesus Christ, of the person Jesus. Now watch this. Not only do we have uh, all the, uh, the things that John saw in his wonder and then John saw his witness, but the next thing that he saw is this, his warfare. Look at his warfare. As this world now is ready to stand in the ultimate battle, good versus evil. Pick up in verse 13. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood as Jesus returns in power. As Jesus returns in glory. As Jesus returns to, 
to, to, to be the righteous judge. As Jesus returns uh, uh, for the warfare of good versus evil, it says here that he will wear a vesture dipped in blood. He came the first time, he was stripped of his clothes. He came the first time, and he was stripped of clothes that were blood-stained. But I will share with you that this is not his blood, but this is the blood of the enemy. This is the blood of the enemy that he comes. Listen, his clothes the first time was gambled as if it was a prize. This time he won't be stripped. This time he won't be humiliated when he returns. He will come with the blood of his enemies upon his vesture. I love the fact of this. In verse 14 it says that he will not come alone though. Look at verse 14 we pick up. And the armies. Armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses clothed in fine, uh, fine linen and white and clean. Oh, listen, all the redeemed. Listen, the angels of the heavens. All oh, that is good. Uh, that, that is following. That is believed. That have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. They're coming back with him. And, and, and on this world is going to send those who have rejected and those uh, uh, evil forces that will come together under the leadership of an antichrist and a beast. And a, and a false prophet and they're going to stand there uh, to, to defy, they're going to stand there as good uh, fights against this evil, evil in the ultimate battle Jesus when he returns will not be alone he's literally going to be followed by the armies of heaven riding on white horses and clothed in fine linen, the redeemed of God will return with Christ uh, when he comes again, what a glorious thought to come with our Lord I, I love this thought that I'm going to get to come back with him and, and I'm going to watch him as he, as he conquers the enemies as, as he sets up his rule as he sets up his millennial kingdom here on this earth, listen we, we will come to fight God's got the battle. We're only going to come to rejoice. We're going to stand and rejoice because all he's got to do is speak the words. We see that in this battle that is here. Look at his weaponry. Look at what he fights this battle of Armageddon. And it says that out of his mouth, in verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. This, but this will be a battle like none before. There will be no conventional, hey, they may have them on their side, but there will be no conventional weapons of, of warfare. The, listen, the Lord will simply speak. And his mighty voice will go forth as a sharp sword. That's why the Bible says that is that listen that, that the Bible or the Word of God is like a two-edged sword. Uh, listen, that word has always been a two-edged sword. He can speak the word and defeat the devil just like that. Notice what it says in that verse 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that uh, that with it he should smite the nation, and he shall rule them with a, a rod of iron. And so he's going to speak the words. He will literally defire his enemy with the words that are there. there. There is power in the word of God. There is power in the word of Christ. While we're here on earth, his power has been displayed many times and times again simply by speaking. Speaking into your heart. Speaking into your life has changed your life. There is power in the word of God. When we read the word of God, there's comfort and there's hope and there's joy and there's peace in the word of God. Why? Because it's a two-edged sword to defeat the things in our life that trouble us, that, that give us heartache. Jesus, when he was tempted for 40 days of the devil, used the word of God. Why? Because it's a two-edged sword. It is the word that will stand. I told you the word of God will stand. It is, the word of God has been scrutinized more than anything in this world. And yet the word of God stands today. And the word of God is still changing lives today. And the word of God is still giving hope today. All Jesus does is he speaks the word. His words come to a troubled sea. His words bring peace to troubled waters. His words even raise the dead back to life. There's power in the words of Jesus. We find then the victory of the king. We find the victory of the king. The remaining verses deal 
with the glorious victory that our Lord will win over Satan and his evil power. In those moments of victory, we find this, a final preparation. Look at this. It says that the Lord talks, to, or the angel says to all the birds that are in the heaven, talking about this heaven that we see in the sky. Here's what it says. It says, hey birds, all y'all gather together because there's a feast that's about to happen. You're about to eat the flesh of men. You're about to eat, listen, all, gather all the birds from all around the world and let them come. Look at verse 17. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of the heaven, this first heaven that you and I see, come and gather yourself together unto the supper. It's going to be provided by who? By, by the great God. There's this final preparation that is happening. And Jesus is about to consume his adversary. And he calls for the fowls of the air to make themselves ready. Come gather yourself together because there's about to be plenty to eat. God is about to prepare a great supper for the birds as they consume the flesh of men. It is the desire of the flesh that has kept them away from God. Think about this. It is the flesh, living by the flesh instead of living by spirit, that has caused them to stand and living in the flesh and shake their hands and fist at God. And here we find that flesh will be eaten by the birds. It is the flesh that continually wars against the spirit. Here the fowls of the air will consume the very thing that has kept them from their salvation, living by the flesh. What a picture we see as the Bible reveals the fate of those who have rejected Christ. Of all the things that we face in life, our flesh is our biggest hindrance. And here the birds are made ready to eat the flesh. But before that, you know the world's not going to go down without a fight. You know the Antichrist that is sitting in the high places? You know the false prophet? The beast that has controlled the economic system with the mark of the beast? They're not going to go down without a fight, right? There is going to be an opposition to this, right? And so we find this global opposition. Look at verse 19. We're getting ready to close. Verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. The battle has been set. There is preparation. The angel has looked at all the files of the air and just sit right here. There's a battle about to take place. Just sit right here for all the flesh of man that has turned their backs on, uh, on God. Those who have, who have denied the living God is about to, to die. As all of the... Y'all, y'all don't, here, here's the thing. You, here's the thing. I know sometimes the devil in our life, he, 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 he tries to do things in our life, but God always uses that. Listen, it's always God's plan. See... Here is the, here's the Antichrist and the beast. and Here's this worldly system. And man, they've gathered all man together. And they gathered all their firepower together. And they gathered everybody from, the, from around the world together to fight against Jesus Christ. And what they don't realize is that's been God's plan all along. He just got them all together in one place. So that he could destroy them there in one place. They all come together. That verse tells us they all come together. The kings and the armies of the world will gather together to do battle of the Lord. They they gather together in hopes of defeating uh, this one who they hate. Who they they hate. Their lives and, and, and pleasures has gone against all that Jesus is. They dominated the world during the tribulation and they feel like this is the last step. If they can just get rid of him, then they can live their sinful desires for as long as they want. But again, they fail to realize that all of this is just working out according to God's plan. Drawing them together to destroy them. The world may feel like they're in control. As the armies gather together and they uh, share with one another and they're, and they're in awe of all the battle gear that they have. They think they're in control. As a matter of fact, they think that they're not accountable to no one. But listen to this. But they will give an account. And it begins on this day. For you see, what happens is total devastation. Let's pick up in verse 20. 
and the beast was taken. And with him the false prophet. They wrought miracles before him. Which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. And them that worshipped his, his image. They both immediately are defeated and cast. Alive into a lake of fire. For their everlasting eternal torment. In a lake of fire. In a lake of fire. Burning. With brimstone. The effort that these have put forth to defeat the Lord will be futile. In an instant. In an instant. He will soundly defeat them. By the saying of a word, it will be over. There won't be a single one left standing when God is through. Look at verse 21. And the remnant. Not just those, but the remnant. What did it say in verse 20? It said, well... Those that worship the beast and the false prophet. The false prophet and the beast have been thrown in the lake of fire. It says, and then all of those. And the remnant were slain with a sword of him that sat upon the horse. Which sword proceeded out of his mouth. And all the fowls, all the birds came and ate of the flesh of all those that were dead in the streets. Uh, Satan's ministers. Satan's ministers defeated quickly. Antichrist, false prophet, judged by God. Those that have deceived the hearts of men, working great wickedness, will be unable to escape the hand of God. There will be no miracles that they can perform to escape the hand of God. They will be cast into the lake of fire alive. Antichrist has enjoyed a season of prominence, but his time and power has come to a dreadful end. Can you imagine the blow to the armies of this world? The, the other group is the sinful men. Sinful men, those who are left, the remnant of the earth, the, the earth dwellers must now face the final wrath of God. This is a dreadful picture. The Lord who, who gave himself upon a, a cross, who, had, who listen, for all who would believe now stands judged as those who have denied him. He was just and that he had sent preachers and prophets and those proclaiming repentance and coming judgment. But they refused his mercy. And so all that's left is judgment there. All that's left is God's judgment. I want to share with you that God is a God of mercy, no doubt. But one day, the Bible says his mercy will end. And one day, good will triumph over evil. The question is, when this day happens, where will you be? Are you going to be on the one that is held as king, as king, as lord of lord, or one that has denied him, lived of the flesh? For you see, a day is coming. I praise the Lord that I was offered by Jesus Christ hanging on a cross salvation. I, I praise him for, for giving me the faith that, that I, I needed to accept him. I, I rejoice today that I have been saved and that one day I will stand in awe of the King of King and Lord of Lord as he deals with the sins of this world. I will stand not there again, not to battle, but I will stand there to praise the victor of this world. And what about you? Have you given your life? Just remember, there is no middle ground with God. There is no middle ground. You're either saved today or you're lost. You're either redeemed and sanctified or you're separated and condemned. Do you know for sure that you have been saved? Do you know that you know that you know? If not, then my, my, my word to you is come and seek Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Come and fall down on your face and cry out to a holy God and, and, and present to Him nothing more than you have, just yourself and your sin. And cry out to a God to save you and to forgive you. And the Bible says that He is just and He'll forgive you of your sins. He'll wash you clean. He'll wash you clean so that you're no longer an enemy of God. You're no longer a victim of this world. But you are a victor in the army, in the king's army, that one day will stand and rule. And of his kingdom, it shall last forever.